Sunday morning. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I'm glad to welcome the congregation of Kidder Mennonite. I get to do that every Sunday, but I'm especially glad this morning to welcome the uh, campuses of uh, Really Recovered to be joining with us today in worship and others who are guests with us today. We're glad that we can all join together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's so appropriate that we do so. Just want to invite you to uh, make uh, this a time of worship, and then we're looking forward to having a time of, of uh, fellowship between this and, and Sunday school, and then Sunday school for the adults is going to be in this space also, and Ken is going to be sharing some uh, further during that time about really recovered, and uh, we're just glad for this morning together. And as I thought about this being Thanksgiving uh, week, uh, many will be celebrating with uh, family and friends in whatever way. It's appropriate that we would on this morning, focus in gratitude to the Lord. And so one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 100, and it says this, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that he, that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The invitation that's given through the psalmist so many years ago and continues to be given to us today is to, to sing and to rejoice and to praise the Lord. And that's what's called upon for us this morning and throughout our lives. And it's in response to who God is. God has created us. God has redeemed us. God has called us into his family. He's given us eternal life. And one day we're going to be all united together in eternity. And so we come in gratitude and praise and thanksgiving this morning. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. God, indeed, we are so grateful for this opportunity we have this morning to join together at this time in this place, and we welcome all who are here in this space, but we also welcome those who are listening in through live stream. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak to our hearts and our minds, that we would be encouraged in our faith journey individually and collectively, and that we go into the world this week and that we proclaim your name, we live as your people, and we invite others to also know you and to serve you. And we're grateful for this season of Thanksgiving. We know that it shouldn't be contained in a day or in a season, but it is uh, really the activity that is ours as your people throughout the year to recognize who you are, to come before you in worship and praise and adoration. And Lord, we want to commit this time together this morning. We just ask that you would meet us in this space and that you'd be glorified in all that is said and all that is done. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We're going to invite Jean to come forward and lead us in our congregational singing. Let's continue our worship by singing together. If you'll take out the blue worship book and turn with me. If you're in the front rows, they're underneath the uh, underneath the shoes. That the song books are. And our first song today is going to be Come You Thankful People Come, which is the words will be on the screen or you can read them out of the, out of the song book. So if you're able, please join me by standing.
think you may know a little bit of background about the Horatio Spafford. She wrote the words to this song, but I'd like to just give you a review that with you this morning because I feel like it is a, as I saw this this morning and last night, uh, Horatio Spafford had a Job life. If you know the scriptures about Job, that uh, it started out, he lost a four year old son to scarlet fever. He was financially ruined in the, in the Chicago Fire of 1871. After that, he sent, uh, he was friends with D.L. Moody, and uh, D.L. Moody was going to be in England. He sent his, his family over to, they were going to vacation over there while, he's, uh, while D.L. Moody was preaching. He sent his family, which was uh, to a vacation. He stayed home because they had some business things to take care of. But, The ship that his, his wife and four daughters were on hit another ship and sank within 12 minutes, lost his four daughters. His wife was saved. And when she got to England, she sent him a telegram saying, Save alone. He immediately got on a ship to England, and as the ship crossed the spot where the other ship went down, he penned the words to this hymn It is well with my soul. <clears throat> but it was, things were not done. He and his wife lost another son after having three more children after that. And they spent their, their remaining life in Jerusalem with, uh, helping the poor and uh, the lost in Jerusalem. So, you know what? We, we can have, if you, as we sing this song, you understand where this man came from. It's very, very powerful to say, it is well with my soul.
to begin us with a time of silent prayer. Just to talk to the Lord on, on your own behalf and on behalf of those who you may have seen raise their hands this morning. from everlasting to everlasting. We know that you are the God of this moment. As the choirs just sung about that time that we'll all gather together in eternity, that we'll gather around that river that flows by the throne of God. We're looking forward to that. We're anticipating that. We know that that's ours through Jesus Christ, but you've called us to live in this world at this time, to live these lives, to live them in a way that would bring you glory and honor and praise. We Come before you recognizing that through Jesus Christ we've been called into ministry individually and collectively and that there's so much in our world that needs the hand of God to come to, to bear and that you want to be a presence in the lives and in the circumstances of this world and, and yet you uh, are limited in some ways because we do not allow ourselves to be the avenues of your love and your grace and your mercy into the lives of the people around us. And so, Lord, we come to you this morning asking that indeed you would give us encouragement and wisdom and discernment and how to be your people in whatever context you place us today and in the days of our lives. We thank you for this wonderful season of Thanksgiving and, and know that there is so much that we are grateful for but at the very center of that is the gift of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We gather together in his name today. We gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we know that there are um, joys and sorrows that uh, touch our lives in this world, and that we're called to lift one another up and to walk together. And as best as we can, we want to do that in the name of Jesus Christ. We know that there are some who raised their hands or stood this morning, signifying that there's something on their hearts this morning that is of a prayer nature, of a concern, and they wanted to lift that up before you, but also lifting it up before us as a congregation. Together we stand with one another. Lord, we want to lift up those concerns that are in our bulletin today and to remember that these are some of the prayer concerns within our congregation, but there are other health concerns that are noted also. But today we lift up Lois Lehman as she'll be having back surgery this coming Wednesday. We pray for Dave as he was transferred after his surgery to the Worcester Hospital for further rehab, and we pray a blessing to be upon him. We thank you for the ministry of Steve Steiner in Kosovo and on the ECMI board, and we pray that as he's traveling, that you would be with him and encourage him and strengthen him for those tasks. We pray for uh, the work of the Nazareth Man House. We are so grateful for Martin and Carolyn Thomas and the work that they're doing, and and we just pray that you would give them strength and encouragement, that you give them wisdom and discernment, that you give them the resources that they need to carry on the ministry that they're doing. We're grateful this morning that Ken Hawkins can be with us and, and the church have really recovered, both from Akron and from Worcester. Lord, we don't fully know the, the ministries that they're involved with, but we are grateful that we can in a small way be partnered with them even in this morning, even as there are ways that we can learn to know one another better today. We, we pray that you would use Ken and, and the really recovered uh, folk in wonderful ways to further your kingdom in these communities. Lord, we know that you're able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine, and so we're praying wonderful blessings upon them, even in this Thanksgiving season. Lord, that's our prayer for one another also, that indeed in this season we would sense your presence, your activity, and we would give you the gratitude that you deserve. For those who will be traveling this coming week, we do pray, Lord, that you would give them traveling mercies and that, indeed, that they would have wonderful times of being with family. We know that there are family traveling to join us in this, this area, and so we pray blessings upon them. Again, Lord, we thank you for this time of worship, and we just ask that you continue to make yourself known. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. A while back, I had the opportunity to uh, hear about Really Recovered uh, through our J.C. Jewels and through Steve Steiner. Uh, we were invited to hear about that at the Christian Missionary Alliance headquarters in Wadsworth and got to meet Ken there as we talked about what Ken was doing and the ministry that he was looking towards doing in Worcester. 
we've been delighted in small ways to be a part of that ministry and uh, we're also very grateful for uh, Carlin Lehman of our own congregation who's been doing a wonderful work and if you haven't had the opportunity to hear about uh, the remodeling of a motel that Carlin has been involved with, it's wonderful. And uh, we're glad that Ken can be here today and to share with us and, and I just told him to be relaxed, uh, that he's among friends. And, uh, and uh, so just to, to lead in whatever way the Lord uh, wants to share to him in this worship time, then we're going to look forward to Sunday school together. Ken, please come and join us. And, and Ken, you'll introduce yourself in ways that I can. So just tell us about your, your family and uh, whatever you want to do with it this time. All right. I don't know if this is on. It says objective, yeah, but it's on. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Ken Hawkins. I am one of the leaders after we recovered. Uh, I, I think what I'm just going to do, because I, I really didn't know, Jesus has given me a word for this time for us. Uh, and then during our, our time together at Sunday school, I'm going to give uh, the abbreviated version of what Jesus has done since I encountered him, what he's done with Really Recovered. I can fill you in then on uh, my family, how you guys have become part of our family and we become part of yours um, and partnering in different ways and kind of it, maybe that can be a little more interactive first and foremost i just really want to tell you guys what an honor and a privilege it is to be standing here right now and man, i really experienced the presence of jesus here this morning and i have uh, been blessed by jesus to go to a lot of different congregations and, and spend time with a lot of different congregations and and uh, Jesus has used my foolish preaching uh, to raise the dead and it's been an amazing um, it's just been amazing to be a part of what Jesus is doing and I just want to let you guys know it's it's really an honor and privilege to just be with you guys here this morning and uh, to just be family and to not be separate churches but be two different congregations and one church and to really experience that unity and to experience um, what Jesus uh, was talking about when he talked about his church and he talked about the unity that there would be and, and there would be this special love that, that would make the world know how alive and powerful he is. Um, and then he came. Jesus said, people will know that I came by the way that you guys love each other. And, um, it, it was funny because I, I had a lot of ties to some different de denominations and stuff, and um, as people found out I was coming, because I've never, listen, I'm just going to be honest, uh, <laughs> like, I didn't know what a Mennonite was, you know, like when I got, when I got to Worcester, I, I didn't know, and, um, and when people heard I was even coming here uh, and had been invited to, to preach and, and speak, you know, different people would come up to me and go, do you know everything they believe, and I'm like, no. Uh, I don't, um, but I know that the interaction I've had with you guys, I've experienced the love of Jesus. And, um, and, and I'll just tell you this, because this is really cool. One of the things that people kept saying to me was, man, you know, the Mennonites are really generous. And, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, like, we've experienced that, and, and we thank Jesus uh, for your generosity, because that's something that Jesus gives you, right? That's not who we are really apart from Jesus as generous people. So Jesus has given that to you guys and what an awesome reputation, because that's his reputation, right? Nobody is as generous as Jesus who gives up his life, leaves the throne, comes to earth and gives up his life and becomes poor so we can become rich. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where I also just think, um, and pray that it'll be a little more convicting to some of the people that said it. Because they kind of said it in a way like, that's their thing. <laughs> They're the generous people. And uh, I just pray that it continues to convict people to go, uh, maybe we should be a little more generous too, you know? Uh, and so I'm, I'm really thankful to be here. But I think one of the things, you know, because we, we maybe have different doctrines and stuff like that, I don't know. Um, but I think people a lot of times get caught up and, and doctrines and stuff, and doctrines are important, right? We have the doctrine of salvation and sanctification and different things like that, and Jesus being our coming king. Those things are all important, 
And yet what happens, I think, sometimes and what we're in danger of, even as we gather week in and week out, is sometimes we don't come here thinking, man, Jesus, I want to know you more today. A lot of times what happens, I think, is one of our favorite verses at really recovered is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it's like anyone who belongs to Jesus, you know, the old life is dead and the new life has begun. And I, I think what happens a lot of times with that is we start to try and teach that as something we've got to teach to people. And say, hey, you've got a new life now. You've got a new life now. But, but what that verse is saying is that something supernatural happens when the spirit of Jesus enters you. And you are now raised from the dead. And things are different. And I love the verse before that because it's just as important. And it's talking a couple of verses before that. meant that Jesus has died for all. And now that we know this and we've experienced his life, uh, we, don't, we don't view people from a human point of view anymore. And then it goes on to say that means that anybody who belongs to Jesus the old life is gone and the new life has become, or has begun. And so a, a lot of times what happens, I think, and what we're in danger of just as humans, all of us, is we start to look at things from a human point of view. We all drift into that and we, I think, be constantly reminded. I think there's probably some people that have just never really seen things from a spiritual point of view. And then there's those of us that constantly need reminded. And Jesus always did this. Jesus always was reminding people to look beneath the surface to judge cor correctly because uh, there's something spiritual that's taking place. And so it's easy for us to, to, to go off of what we can see, right? And, and yet what we need to do is, is have our eyes open, the eyes of our heart, like it says in Ephesians 1, to see things spiritually. I pray that, and so like what, what happens is, is leading up to a time like this, I'm always asking Jesus, what specifically do I need to pray for, for myself and for the people that I'll be spending time with? And, and that prayer has been that our hearts would be, you know, it's Ephesians 1, that our hearts would be flooded with light. Our hearts would be flooded with light. That we would have spiritual wisdom and understanding to know God more. That we would understand that, man, we, we don't have them all figured out. That's just such an awesome, humbling thing. And, and such an awesome thing to know, like, man, that there's just constantly more. That you could dive into the ocean that is Jesus, but you'll never hit the bottom. And so my prayer has been, you know, that we would kind of have spiritual blinders. And I know, sitting here right now, you go, hold on, that's backwards. But no. Because I moved to Worcester and I learned that horses have blinders. And so when I got here, I was like, what are those things on the horses' heads? And, uh, and they were like, they're blinders or they're blinders, which gets them to focus and see things, right? And, and to see exactly what they want them to focus on. And so that's what I've been praying for for our time. Because it's easy for us to go off of what we can see. That the Holy Spirit has to do something for us to see what we can't see. And that's what I've been praying for a time. Because I, I, don't, I don't know if you've experienced it, I'm sure it's just me, but like you ever thought you had like uh, somebody figured out and you never really met them, and then you kind of met them and you were like, oh, they're not a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or the other way, you're just like, you thought you had somebody figured out and you met them and you're like, man, they're really nice. I had no idea they were gonna be that way because you had your preconceived notions or you, or you you had an idea of how to do something and you kind of got into the project and you got so far and then all of a sudden you were just like, you know, somebody came along and like, you know what, you should do this and this. But I didn't even see that. I didn't even see that. And, and, and that's what Jesus is saying in Isaiah 55. In Isaiah 55, Jesus uh, in verse 8 says this, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And so Jesus gives this big, huge separation between our thoughts, our ways, his thoughts, his ways. And he goes, man, so far beyond what you could imagine. And he, and he gives this description as, uh, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts 
higher than your thoughts. And what I love about this is that in Isaiah 55, then Jesus goes on to reveal some of his ways that are different than ours. He goes on to reveal how his thoughts are different than ours. He, he goes on to say, hey, listen, it, it's with my word. It's going to go out. It's going to accomplish all I want it to. And then he goes on in verse 13 to say, where once there was thorns, cypress trees will grow, where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. And these events will bring honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. And just right there, he's just going, you know, a lot of times we don't see correctly because we go off of what we can see. And yet he goes, hey, where there's thorns, maybe where there's pain, maybe where there's, there's not fruit, he goes, hey, I'm going to change that. Because a lot of times I think in the church we can get caught up on what good soil is or what good soil isn't, and we'll be tempted to go off of what we can see. And yet Jesus here is going, oh yeah, where there's weeds, I'm going to make this beautiful tree. And, and what he's saying is going, hey, when I change soil. That's what Jesus is saying. He goes, I change soil. Where once these things were, this pain, this death, all these things, he goes, I change that and I give it life. And it's an everlasting sign. And so the, the reason I bring that up is because if that's true, and I know that it is, because that's the word of God, we should be people who run towards thorns and weeds. But a lot of times that's not how we see things. We don't look beneath the surface at uh, what we know Jesus can do. I mean, and, and this is, like I said, this is something that Jesus always was doing, is getting people to really look beneath the surface of what's going on spiritually. He was always getting his disciples to look at what they couldn't see. And you see this, Jesus shows up on the scene, and that what, the religious leaders of the time thought they had Jesus figured out, and Jesus was constantly going, you don't know me. You know, Mark chapter 7, he's going, no, 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 I'm on your lips, but I'm far from your heart, you don't see correctly. In Matthew chapter 25, he's talking about the talents and the responsibility to invest the life that Jesus has given. You know, there's one guy that has five and then two, and then one, the guy with one goes, hey, I, you know, I knew you were a harsh man. And Jesus goes, you don't even know me. You don't know me. And, and, and I love how the Bible says, man, Jesus is both, you know, severe and kind. It's two things. And so Jesus is constantly wanting us to look beneath the surface to see what's, what's really going on. And so if you go to Mark chapter 4, in Mark chapter 4, uh, Jesus tells a parable about a farmer scattering seeds. There's four different types of soil that Jesus talks about here. And, 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 and this parable is really important. I know the whole word of God is important, but Jesus himself, in this parable, after he tells it, tells his disciples, like, hey, if you can't understand this one, you can't understand the rest of it. I mean, he says that here um, in verse 13. If you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you, other, how will you understand all the other parables? And, and so Jesus tells this parable about a farmer scattering seeds, and he says, hey, you know, some of the seed falls on the footpath, and it's snatched up right away, right? And some of it falls on shallow soil and it sprouts real quick and it has joy, but it doesn't have deep roots, so it doesn't last. You see, a lot of us, when we see that happen, when somebody hears the word of God and they have this joy, we get excited, and I think rightfully so, but I think we also have to recognize what Jesus is saying here. Because it's the minute that they have troubles or there's persecution for believing God's word, they fall away, right? And he says some of it falls uh, among the thorns. And, and then it, it, it gets choked out by the worries of this life and the lure for wealth and different things. And then Jesus goes on to say, but then there's this good soil. Now keep in mind, Jesus, and only Jesus, is the one who changes soil. And so Jesus goes on to say, and there's, there, there's this good soil, and, and you know, I, I'm not going to stand up here to be five ways to be good soil this morning. 
right? I just want the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. But he says that the good soil is the one that uh, hears God's word and accepts it or puts it on. And, and then it produces 30, 60, 100 times more than what was planted. And so uh, another one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 4.20. Because it says this, the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, but it's living by the power of God. And what I love as we look at this is Jesus isn't just going to be a lot of talk, right? He, he tells them this parable. He tells them how important this parable is. And he goes, if you don't understand this, you won't understand the other ones. And then he goes on to continue and say, hey, who would light a lamp and then put it under a bed? He goes, no, 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 a lamp is for a dark place, right? And so he goes, who would light a lamp and put it in red? A lamp is for a dark place. He goes on after that to goes, man, pay attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, more will be revealed. And so Jesus is sitting here and, and having his disciples really lean in and listen to what he's saying. Now, I don't know about you. I have kids. And so when I talk about listening, there's usually action attached to that. Okay. Because I tell my kids something, and then I go, did you hear me? And they go, yeah. And then when they're not doing it, I'm like, why aren't you listening? Right? And, and so Jesus here is going, man, pay attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, man, more will be revealed. But for those, for those that aren't really listening, he goes, well, even what they think they know will be taken away from them. And so Jesus is building off of this and then goes on to say, hey, the kingdom of God is like a farmer, once again, scattering seeds. And he goes, you know what? Day and night doesn't matter what he's doing. His job is to plant. But only the Holy Spirit can make something grow. And Jesus goes on from there and talks about a, a mustard seed. And see, what Jesus is constantly doing here is he's, he's getting the disciples, he's getting us to see things differently. What he's doing is he's taking how we see things, how we think about things, and he's flipping them right side up. And he goes, no, 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 it's like, the kingdom of God's like a mustard seed, it's, it's really small. It seems insignificant, but when it grows, when Jesus does what only he can do, man, it gets really big, and it produces something really awesome. And, and then this is the part that I was getting to, because Jesus isn't just a lot of talk. So he, he gives the talk, and then he goes, let's get in the boat. See, because he's going to go, let me show you what it looks like to actually live by the power of God. And so he tells his disciples, let's, let's get in a boat and go to the other side. Now, let me just tell you a few things, because they're headed to the other side, where there's a, a crazy man with a legion of demons hiding out in a tomb. Right? And Jesus just said, hey, everything that's hidden will be brought into the light. And he goes, a light is for a dark place. And so he doesn't just tell them that, but he shows them, hey, it's time to go to that dark place. And, and as they're on their way over there, crossing over on the boat, they hit this crazy storm. Jesus has taken a nap. And they go and wake Jesus up, freaking out. And, and what Jesus is doing is a few things I know for sure. One of them, he's, he's letting them know, guess what? Your human strength, your talent, isn't going to be enough to handle what's going on over here, right? That, that when they get over there, it says, man, that this guy that was demon-possessed and crazy was so violent that nobody wouldn't even go through that place. And so the disciples were just sitting around and came up with their own ideas. Do you know what we should do? We should go over there to where that, that crazy guy is that nobody wants to go near because he's so violent. But yet Jesus goes, hey, where you would never go. Let me take you. Let me take you to the place nobody else wants to go. This is really important because what Jesus is also saying is this guy and people like this are our responsibility, church. They're our responsibility. And one of the tragedies, I think, is that the church, and by and large, at least in this country, has handed over our responsibility to the world in a lot of ways. 
And it's because a lot of times we're not looking at what we can't see. We're not looking at what we can see. So I know Jesus is doing that, right? He's taking his disciples somewhere. Nobody else really wants to go. He's taking them there to show them what it looks like to not just be a lot of talk, but to live by the power of God. He's showing them that, hey, guess what? These people over on the other side have been chaining this guy up. They've been, uh, you know, trying to manage his behavior, and nobody's strong enough to subdue him. So he goes, he goes you know what? You guys aren't going to be able to do it either. Your talents aren't enough, and, and these guys are fishermen. Right? And they get halfway over and they're like, uh, we need some help growing a boat. And Jesus is going, yeah, you do. He's going, yeah, you do. Listen, if there was one thing on this earth you would think they would have been able to pull off, it would have been that. Right? That would have been the thing. They spent all their time doing that. And yet they find themselves going, I don't know. Our, our human efforts, our, our talents aren't going to do it. We need to live by the power of God. And then one of the other things uh, that Jesus is doing, right, he's, he's, like I said, taking these guys to be a light in a very dark place. Jesus is going, that, that's what it means. And too often, I think, um, we're okay getting together and being a bunch of lights in one place. And we should, because Jesus is just, he is worthy of our praise. I mean, that's why we're here, right? We're here for him. And we're here to even know him more. That's, Jesus wants to do that. He wants to reveal himself more to us. And if we're honest, like I said, a lot of times we can come to our gatherings and we don't walk in here thinking, man, I'm going to leave. I mean, we say it and, and, and pastors will say it a lot of times, right? They'll go, hey, change us. And it almost becomes like this cliche thing that we say, we're like, I don't want to be changed. Some people walk into the gathering not even thinking they need to be changed anymore. And yet Jesus goes, man, wherever the Spirit is, there's freedom. And the Spirit makes us more and more like Jesus. And, and so, obviously, we're supposed to constantly be changed, be being changed more and more into His image until one day we're with Him and we don't know exactly what we'll be like, but we'll be like Him, right? And, and so, Jesus is taking these guys over to a place nobody wants to go to show them, hey, the kingdom of God isn't just a lot of talk, but it's living by the power of God. And so they get over here, and, and they get off the boat, and a guy comes running out of the tombs, and it says he's cutting himself and howling. Who in this place would who'd go, good soil? There it is. Right? And let's just be honest. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see that. No. That's good soil. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying. You see, he's living out what he just taught them. He always does this. He always does this. It's not just a lot of talk. Jesus goes, let me take you to the good soil. You know what else Jesus is showing them here? Going through that storm. Man, the lengths to which he's willing to go to save one. I mean, look at, look at the, what he's willing to endure and what he's willing to go to, right? It just points to the cross. And that's what I love because as praying for a time today, I was like, I just, Jesus, I just don't want any part of human wisdom. I want spiritual wisdom. And you know what's so great about that is you can just always just look at the cross. Because I'm going, that's not how I would have went about reconciling the world. Right? And that's what Jesus says. He goes, and the cross just destroys human wisdom. And people are just like, I, I don't know. I wouldn't have done that, right? And just let you know, man, I need Jesus. And, and it's only foolish to people who are headed for destruction. And so the Jesus is showing also the, the lengths to which he's willing to go to get to this one guy over here that otherwise would seem what? Very small and insignificant. And you know what, Jesus, what did Jesus say? Because the kingdom of God is a little mustard seed. And I just love this because Jesus is going, watch what I'm going to do. Watch what I'm going to do. And, and this guy comes running out of the tombs, runs out, right? And, and a legion of demons just fall in the presence of Jesus. Just fall down in the presence of Jesus. This guy, nobody wanted to go near, can't even stand in his presence. And there's also this, this 
guy that's going, I need help. Right? Like, everybody's been trying to help me, but they haven't been dealing with the issue, and yet Jesus goes straight to the real issue. It says he falls down, and the demon squeals, and because Jesus already said to the demon. I love this, because Jesus goes, hey, we're here to deal with the spiritual problem. See, everybody thought all the things this guy did was the problem. <laughs> and, and they were going off of what they could see rather than what they couldn't see. And, and so what I, what I love about this is this legion of demons, this one guy that seems so insignificant. Jesus goes, no, that's good soil. And so Jesus sets this guy free, right? He, he, he sets him completely free, and it says there he is, you know, he's clothed because he was running around naked, he's clothed, he's sane, he's sitting at Jesus' feet. And then what's Jesus tell him to do? He goes, hey, go to the ten times and tell everybody the amazing things that God has done for you. That's a really important part here because I think a lot of times we get caught up thinking that we have to stand in a position like this or something to be effective for the kingdom or we think we got to have some years under our belt or we think you know I got some things that I need to kind of clean up before Jesus can use me and, and so we get caught in this place where we're, there's some future version of myself that Jesus is going to use one day but right here what Jesus says is he wants to use you from where you're at wants to use you where you're at, but from where you're at. Like, this guy's had this crazy encounter with Jesus, and you know what? He's probably not going to run around and talk about doctrine too much, but he's going to be able to have this story about the amazing power and love of Jesus. And see, Jesus has changed this soil here in this guy, and now this guy is the sign of God's everlasting power and love. And so he sends him off to the, to the ten towns to tell everybody what he's done. And, and another thing I think I want to point out really quick is it, this is why the before pick is so important. And what I mean by that, I don't know about you, but you know, people a lot of times when there's these diets out there and there's all this stuff, um, they don't just show you the after pick, right? It's the before picture that actually brings value to the after picture. You see the, you see the after and you're like, okay, yeah. But when you see how bad it was before, you know, or, or if there's some old rusted up car from, you know, way back, whatever, that's a classic and it's completely restored and you see it driving down the road. I don't even know a lot about cars, but I know when I see those, I'm like, that thing's pretty cool. That thing's awesome. You see these old restored classic cars, and then what happens is when somebody shows you the before picture, when it's just a, a pile of rust sitting in a garage, and you're like, man, that now is this? It, it, it just makes you stand in awe. And yet there's this thing, for some reason, listen, I, 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 I just now, since I've known Jesus seven years, you know, uh, that's my time in church and stuff. And that's why I think it's so great. Everybody's like, you're going to read on the Mennonites? I said, no. You're going to read up and figure, no, I'm going to do that. Like, I, I've been invited to proclaim the gospel. How oh, awesome. Like, you know, but, but my time in church has taught me that there's this thing that kind of creeps into the church of like, hey, that was your past, so forget about it. And they use things like, hey, well, Jesus has removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. Absolutely. Meaning he's not holding those against you. Yet, if we're not sharing who we were, it doesn't build value to who Jesus has made us. And, and listen, I get it. Uh, a lot of people think, well, we don't have the same story as some of these people. But what I love about this is Jesus didn't take somebody that was demon-possessed by a legion of demons that he set free to go encounter the man who had a legion of demons that needed to be set free. He took some fishermen. 
and he took followers of Jesus, right? He, he, he was going, man, if you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, that's what that guy needed. He needed to encounter Jesus. And so everybody sitting here, no matter, uh, you know, how bad your story was, which, by the way, death to life is death to life. I just want to let you know. Yeah. Right? But, but no matter how bad you think it is or not bad enough or whatever, it's like, man, Jesus made it really clear. His followers, people empowered by his spirit, that this is our responsibility. And what I love about this is uh, in Mark chapter 7, Verse 31, Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and what? The region of the Ten Towns. So you, you see what just happened here, what's about to happen? It, it, Jesus goes, hey, listen, there's this good soil, and it's not what you think it is, and, and you gotta, you know, you got to let me fix the way you look at things and, and flip it around so it's right side up. And he goes, you know, and it's going to be... Very small what's planted, but it's going to produce 30, 60, 100 times. Let me go show you what this looks like. He sends this guy off to the 10 towns to proclaim all the things that God has done, all the amazing things God has done for him. Then he shows up, Jesus does later, at the 10 towns here in Mark 7, and look at what's happening. He shows up at the 10 towns, and a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man and to heal him. Jesus led him away from a crowd. Because you know what happened? That one guy went off to the ten towns and told him all the amazing things Jesus had done. And now look at what happened. They're taking this one guy that's got an issue and they're bringing him to Jesus. And there's this crowd of people because what has happened is this good soil has produced 30, 60, 100 times more than what was planted. Seems very small has become something very big. What seems very small is a crowd of people coming to Jesus and bringing somebody to Jesus that more than likely they would have tried to handle a different way. But they knew. They knew because they came face to face with that guy who was an everlasting sign of Jesus' power and his love. And started to produce. It started to produce way more than what was planted. And so, listen, I, I just, I think that the danger always in, in, in the church, just in general, is that it can turn into a lot of talk. It can turn into a lot of talk. You know, the doctrines, we'll, we'll read the word, we'll. We'll talk about it. And yet, you know, the kingdom of God isn't just a lot of talk. But it's living by the power of God. Like living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what that means? That means that, like, we're going to have to go to some places that are uncomfortable. So that Jesus' power can be seen. We're going to have to go to some places that are dark. Because that's where you put a light on a stand in a dark house so it's not dark anymore. And, and I, I just, you know, Jesus, he just goes, it's better for you that I do leave. Yeah, he tells his disciples that later on in John 16. He goes, it's better for you that I leave because if I don't, I, I won't send you the Holy Spirit. He goes, it's better I leave. I'm going to send you power of the kingdom of God. And he, he goes, the comforter. And I think what's scary a lot of times, especially in our culture, is it's like, you don't need to do that, Jesus. We're comfortable. <laughs> why, why do I need the comforter if I'm not in a position where I'm uncomfortable? And so, my prayer, once again, for our time is just that our hearts will be flooded with light. We have spiritual yes. wisdom. We know Jesus more when we're done here. Like, we actually go, man, no, I, I know Jesus more 
you know, or man, I was reminded. And we need that. That's why we do this. We constantly need that. I constantly need that. To be reminded who Jesus really is. We know him more. We, we walk out of here different. Like, that's what's available. We walk out of here different, and I, I just, you know, before I pray for us, I, I just got to share this because I've been, you know, there's this, this uh, Psalm 92, verse 4, that's just, listen to what it says. It says, you thrill me, Lord, with all you have done for me. I sing for joy because of what you have done. And he just goes, you thrill me. Like, are you still thrilled by Jesus? Like, captivated by who he is. Undone by the cross. Just thrilled. Like, I have eternal life. I, I, I just walk out of here and get by the bus. It's okay. It shouldn't even matter. Like, I don't have to fear death. I don't have to live under the doom and gloom of death anymore. And Jesus has removed that. He's given me new life and new desires and new thoughts and everything. And it's just like, are you still thrilled by who Jesus is? By what he's done? By what he's doing? The promise of what he will do and all, all things will just be made new. And, and we won't just be floating you know, but then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and, and we get to rule and reign with him forever. Right? Let me pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for family. I thank you for family. I thank you for even making clear uh, the true definition of what family is. I know that I used to think I had that figured out. And what a huge point of view I had on that. I thank you, Jesus, for, for family, people filled with your spirit. How you unite us together as different parts of a body. But that Jesus, you're the head. I pray that we would constantly be in submission to you in that way. We would take that serious, that you're the head. And so it's like, whatever you think, Jesus, where, wherever you want to go, whatever you're doing, like we just want to be with you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fall on each and every one of us in a fresh, powerful way, that we would just be thrilled with Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Let's uh, join together to take out the blue songbook once again. Turn to 327, Grace Thy Faithfulness. And let's sing this as our response to Ken this morning. If you're able, please join me by standing.
transition time. We're going to allow the children to find their children's Sunday school classes, and uh, then we're going to invite you as adults to remain here. We're going to hear more about uh, from Ken and about really recovering. I would invite you to bow for the benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, both now and forevermore. Amen. Invite you after our Sunday school time uh, to do again. You're welcome to engage with one another. I'm sure glad to have you connecting in, in wonderful ways in this way. And um, just a reminder that after our Sunday school hour, which is going to end around 1130, that uh, we're going to be over in the fellowship building. For those of you who don't know, it's the next building over, and uh, there's going to be food there. And we certainly invite everybody to stay and enjoy a time of, of fellowship with one another. I know that I was given sort of some announcements to give on behalf of the witness and service. And I'm just not big on reading other people's announcements. Um, just know that we are trying to figure out as a congregation and through our witness and service how we can better connect with Really Recovered and with the ministry that's going on uh, there. And you're going to hear about that in just a few moments. And then also that we're uh, looking at a, a special uh, project during uh, our Christmas time. They're going to be raising some funds. So we're going to be raising funds to help put up a, a pavilion. Uh, I think at the Worcester uh, facility. And uh, we know that that can be a real blessing. And so I'm going to invite Kent to come forward and just, uh, again, the time is yours to use as you see fit. questions along the way. Um, I, I'll just give you um, maybe like a brief version of how I encountered Jesus and my family and that kind of stuff, and then what Jesus has been doing and how we ended up where we're at right now. So I'm going to skip a lot of detail um, and just try and hit some things because it would take, I, I was telling my wife the other day, like I'm learning um, what the Holy Spirit through John was saying. He's like, man, if I told everything that Jesus did, um, I couldn't fill up all the books in all the world. And, and, and I'm, I'm getting to experience that in my life where, you know, more and more uh, it, it becomes harder uh, when I get invited to places. And they're like, tell us the story of really recovering. Like, oh, man, you know, and an hour goes by and I just met Jesus. <laughs> and so um, what I can tell you is that uh, for 26 years, I was in addiction, um, and for 26 years, I was also demon-possessed, and so I experienced uh, demon possession, and uh, that got worse and worse over the years, 
And from the time I was probably like uh, right around 11 or 12 is when I got into drugs and started you know, getting into drugs, drinking, stealing, alcohol, that kind of stuff uh, from friends, parents, and stuff like that. Uh, but from a very early age, um, I had experienced um, demonic activity, just from an early age. Uh, hearing my name called, uh, seeing things that, um, yeah, that, that, you know, you try and tell people and it's just your kid or whatever, and, and it wasn't that they, you know, you're, you're just young and you think like, hey, I saw something looking at me, <laughs> and then it wasn't there. And so um, that, was, that was my life. Um, so for 26 years, that got worse and worse. Um, I was in, in and out of jail well over a dozen times. I was, uh, I went to 17 treatment centers and uh, completed uh, almost all of them. And I was just looking uh, for, for an answer. And uh, my parents, you know, they went to church uh, a few times a week when I was young. And we went with them. Uh, it was a Pentecostal church, uh, and I was not a good influence. And so, you know, at a very young age, I was probably around that 11 or 12 years old, uh, they didn't think it would be best, the church didn't think it would be best if I was there. So, um, uh, let me just see here. So my first arrest, I was 16 years old. I, I got into drugs, I, I started selling drugs about 14, and uh, did it for popularity. Um, you know, wanted to be liked, wanted to uh, be the person that when he showed up, everybody wanted to see and to have that attention. And I was very selfish and self-centered and thought that I was the subject of creation. And so, um, so I started selling drugs when I was about 14, but by the time I was 16, I was just pretty much doing that to supply my own addiction that had started. And uh, my first arrest at 16 years old was on Christmas Eve. Well, it was my third arrest. So I got arrested twice in a week. And I, I just, um, I remember my first arrest, I had this secret life that nobody knew about. Like, my parents didn't know that I did drugs. Nobody really knew, just a close group of friends, if you want to call them that, that sold drugs. And so I got arrested, and I remember my mom showed up at the police station and went, that's crazy, that's impossible. And then a week later, I got arrested for the same thing. And she was like, that's impossible? And, um, and then by the time, a couple months passed on Christmas Eve, I ran out of drugs, and uh, on Christmas Eve had the first time that I, I felt like this heaviness of death um, just fall on me. I'll never forget that feeling, because um, when I hear about suicides and stuff, I understand that feeling. It's different than just like, hey, my life sucks. There's a heaviness of darkness that like falls on you and you just have this feeling of like I should kill myself and so I remember I was 16 I was sitting outside my parents house um, on the porch and looking through the window and they were in there doing the Christmas thing and everybody you know kids were running around little nephews and stuff about to open up gifts they're all excited and the whole family's in there but I was sitting out there and I could just I could just I just had this separation of just like you know it was just like two different worlds were happening. And so um, I, had, I had run away too around that age, back and forth, and was um, staying under the Y Bridge in Akron, Ohio. Uh, so it was a really bad neighborhood that I stayed in down there. I lost the apartment to the apartment. Um, it, was just, it was a place where just criminals could kind of win. Uh, cops didn't go through there and stuff at the time. And so um, it was just a different world. And um, so then I, I ran out of drugs on Christmas Eve and I stole a car and was running out of gas, went to a gas station, opened up the glove compartment to see if there was any money in it for gas and a fish scaling knife fell out. And so I decided that it would be a good idea to rob that gas station. And so I robbed that gas station and then I robbed two others that night. And I got arrested at four o'clock in the morning, trying to rob the third one and was taken directly to Dan Street in Akron, and I would stay there almost a year from that time I woke up. I'll never forget this, because I worked at the jail now, I'm the chaplain at the Wayne County Jail. And you want to talk about a sign of Jesus' everlasting power and love, there you go. Um, I, I just, yeah, they gave me the keys, okay, uh, in an office, I'm like, okay. Um, 
but I remember waking up that morning. I was talking to a guy about this the other day. He was getting booked into the jail, and I just went over and just started talking to him because I could just get on common ground with those guys really quick. And um, I remember a CEO just throwing me a pair of socks and go, Merry Christmas. You know, and that was my Christmas. And um, that, that just stuck with me. I remember that. And you know, and then it was a new world, and you had to learn to shower with a bunch of other people and go to the bathroom in front of a bunch of other people, and there's just things like that that got used to, and I had always got in trouble, but got out of trouble, but I had done something now that I didn't even understand the, the gravity of the situation, and I remember they gave my mom a special visit on Christmas, because it was Christmas, and she came in, and I was like, when are we going home? And she was like, I don't know. She's like, I can't get you out of this one. And so I was there almost a year. I got transferred from there to my third treatment center, uh, so I'd already done two uh, before that, and I spent almost a year there, eight, nine months there. And so anyways, I tell you that to just tell you that that was my beginning, <laughs> uh, and it would go on for 26 years. So it just got worse and worse, caught secret indictments for drug trafficking, you know, 19, 22, 27, something like that. So it would just go on and on and on, and get worse and worse, and as that would happen, I would have more and more darkness. And I would have more and more encounters with demons, and um, uh, at the end, I was shooting up three grams of heroin and fentanyl a day, and every vein in my body was blown out. And sometimes it would take me hours to find a vein that I could actually use to shoot up. And um, met my wife uh, in there. I was married once, uh, had a kid, got divorced, and. Uh, met my wife Megan. She's gonna be here on the women's thing on the Monday, whatever. I saw the sign up there, um, and so she's gonna share her side of it. And so people always go, I'd love to hear her side of that. Um, so the women will get to hear that. But um, you know, she was a drinker when I met her. We each had a kid from a previous marriage, and then I taught her how to do drugs. And so um, I remember she o she overdosed a few times. And one time was really bad. She overdosed in the half bathroom, and the kids are outside banging on the door, asking for mommy. Um, you know, because we have two kids together, and we have two kids from our other marriages, and so they're just little babies. Um, our kids, and they were banging on the door asking for mommy, and she was purple. And I remember I'd been up for days, because I would stay up 14, 15, 16, 17 days at a time. And I remember just trying to lift her lifeless body and I couldn't do it. <laughs> I just didn't have the energy to do it. And I was trying to do something that I thought was CPR, but I didn't know what I was doing really. And out of nowhere, she just took a breath. And I just carried her out and put her on the couch. And so I know now that it wasn't anything I did. Um, but uh, we turned her house into a dope house. Uh, we'd smoke crack, uh, $1,000 worth of crack in a day. Uh, got really good at selling uh, things and became a salesman and I would um, work 40, 50, 60 hours a week selling things but all of it went to drugs. We were eight, nine months behind on our rent. <laughs> and so we turned our house into a dope house and kids were running around eating off the floor, little babies, uh, able to while. And it was, it was bad. It was, I, I tell you all that because I think it's the before pick. I mean, you've got to see that so that you can just go, wow, look at what Jesus did. Um, so it was really bad, and it got so bad at the end, like I could uh, see demons, I could hear them, um, I would have conversations with them. They could touch me sometimes, I could feel them touch me. And I would lock myself in a closet, there was this little closet I would lock myself in, and I would bang my head against the wall, and I would cut myself with a butcher knife, and just, just cut myself and just blood everywhere. So the, the guy in Mark 5 in the tombs, howling and cutting himself with rocks, that's that's me. You know, everybody reads the Bible and goes, oh, David, oh, that was me. So, like, I get to be the crazy guy in the tombs with the demons. Um, and yet, Jesus. So, what happens is I get into a fight with eight African cops in the middle of the night. And. Um, the jury's still out on who won that fight. But if you ask them, they think they did. Um, <laughs> I have since humbled myself to the realization that they did. Um, but, so I got to fight with eight actor cops. They pulled me over, I had an eight ball crack. I've been up for days drinking, driving around, it's three o'clock in the morning. And um, 
Yeah, I just said remember now. I car, we got a huge fight, and so I got assaulted on a police officer and another felony drug charge. And I went home and was sitting in my living room middle of the night after a few days because I, I, I made a bond after like three days. And um, I don't believe in coincidences, but it was Christmas time again. And uh, here we are, like a day before Christmas Eve, I make bond. And so um, I tried to hold it together for a couple of weeks. And I uh, believe it was January 19th, or I'm pretty sure it was the 19th. Um, I was sitting in my living room in the middle of the night, went out and got two fifths of liquor in a pocket full of dope. I was about to do the same thing that I've always done. And I was just sitting in this living room, and I sat there for hours before I did anything. I just remember sitting there for hours, surrounded by demons, and I could just feel the darkness in that room. It was always like that. And my wife and the kids were up in bed, and I'm sitting there. Um, hours go by. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. And I have this realization that if those demons are real, that, that Jesus is real. And so... The very next thing that fell over me was a, a fear, like a, a different fear <laughs> than I had of everything else. Um, this fear of the Lord, and and then I just uh, started to beg Him to come back and show me what to do, because I figured, well, one one He was far away, right? He had to be. Look at how I lived my life. Look at all the people I hurt. Look at everything I had done. He didn't want anything to do with me. Um, you know, I'm not good soil. Jesus uh, is after good soil. I didn't even know what that was, right? Um, and uh, the second thing was, is like, hold on a minute. I had gone to treatment center after treatment center after treatment center, and um, I had worked steps forwards and backwards and made up a God of my own understanding a bunch of times. And I just was like, I guess I just missed a step or something. There's something I had to miss, or maybe I just didn't do something right. And so I started to beg Jesus, come back and just show me what to do, and I'll do it. And I mean, and it was the first time that I was really in my heart, like, in a place of, like, no, I mean it. Like, I'm done. I just, whatever it is, I'll do it. Because I've been in jail a lot, and a lot of times when you're in jail, you're like, get me out of here, and I'll never do it again. Um, and you don't even know if you believe. <laughs> you're just talking to, just in case you're there. Um, but I remember what was different about my last arrest is, you know, you always have a plan for what you're going to say to the judge so you can make bail and get out. And, uh, you know, you've thought it through, and you're sitting there with a bunch of other inmates, and you guys are discussing your plans before you go in. And I'll never forget that because I was sitting there, and they asked me, what are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? You got a sold on police officer. What are you going to tell them? And I just said, it doesn't matter. I was like, I'm in jail either way. It didn't matter. Like, I was a prisoner. I was surrounded by darkness and demons either way. So it didn't matter where I was where my, where my location was, I was, I was in prison. And so I'm um, sitting there in that living room and I started to out loud, just, you know, go, okay, you're real, you're real, then come back, just show me what to do. Come back and show me what to do, I'll do whatever it is, just come back and show me. And in that moment, um, Jesus spoke to me uh, from over my shoulder, out loud. Um, it's the only time I've heard him speak audibly. Um, and he said three words to me. He said, I never left. And it was the most beautiful, loudest whisper, musical, I, I couldn't even describe. Couldn't put words to it until later when I read the Bible and I was reading Revelation. And John goes like a trumpet blast over my shoulder. He spoke. I went, that was it. I was trying to tell people, like, in our culture, but it sounded like T-Pain. It was like auto-tuned. I didn't know, you know. Like, but it was the most beautiful, powerful, you know, like, just... Because people would ask that, what do you sound like? like? It was like it was music, but it was words, and I couldn't explain it, you know? I didn't know. My mom brought me a Bible every time I was in jail, so I had a lot of Bibles, but I didn't read them. And, um, and so, uh, so, so anyways, he speaks, and he just says, I never left, and uncontrollably, I fell on my face, and the room cleared, and there was just peace in that room, and I couldn't even stand up. I couldn't stand up. I was on my face just crying and crying. And, and Jesus did in three words what I couldn't do in three decades. And, uh, 
And when I got off the floor, I was different. I was different. I, I was. I dumped everything. I ran up and told my wife, like, God spoke to me. He spoke to me out loud. I woke her up, and she was like, "You're high," you know. <laughs> I don't know why she would think that. Um, but after that, I was her drug dealer, right? And and she wouldn't get drugs anymore because I was different, and everything had changed. And and she couldn't deny that because. I couldn't go five minutes without getting high, or at least plotting the scheming of how I'm gonna get high. Um, and so, everything changed, and, and my wife eventually came to this place too, where she gave her life to Jesus, and um, I remember she was like really, she was really dumbfounded by me, because like, I was just free. <laughs> I was just, man, I had life, and she'll tell you this story, she'll go, he was like skipping around all happy, and I just kept going, I know, some of the things you've done, that's, how's that possible, right? And, um, you know, we have done horrible things. Um, we, we, like I said, turned our house into a dope house. And so we had our kids in the room while we sell drugs and do drugs and all kinds of stuff, you know? So um, that was hard for her as a mom, especially to go, man, I've done drugs with my kid on my mouth and stuff. And so um, she's looking at me, who played a part in that, and she only got to catch like three years. I think of my crazy. So, and that was enough for her to just go, how is this possible? You know, she just, I was just different. The spirit of Jesus just gave me a new heart and knew everything. And so I was death to life. Um, and so, yeah, that happened. And, and so then everything, here we are, pretty much. Like, I just started telling people because I had this realization that I knew all these people that were. Uh, being led astray by treatment centers and stuff, and they were being told that they could make up their own God, and if you did these steps, and they were trying to manage behavior, and I knew that there was definitely two kinds of people in addiction. There were the people, well, we'll say three. There's the people that are just out there, and they just don't care, and they just want to continue, but then you got the people that are going to treatment, and um, they get better for a little while, and then they're in this vicious cycle of things are good for a while, and then it's bad, and then things are good, and then it's bad, and just stuck there. Um, and then you got the other people who I worry about more, probably. And those are the people that have been sober for a really long time that don't know Jesus. Because they think they're okay. You know? And Satan doesn't care if you go to hell sober or not. And so I knew, I was like, I just, I had this, this crazy desire to read the Word. And so I ran to, you know, the room uh, and got on the shelf and grabbed one of them. Bibles my mom had got me and um, was just devouring the word. I just couldn't put it down. And I just had to know more. Right? And just like we were talking about today, I was like, I gotta know more about who you are that you spoke to me. I gotta know you. I gotta know more about like I witnessed something so powerful <laughs> that I was just like, and so um, so I'm just devouring uh, the word, and then what starts to happen is um, I start to feel the Holy Spirit go, you need to make these videos and tell people. And so I started to make these little short videos that were like three minutes, um, something I'd come across in scripture, and then I would just share my story, how I went with it, and and then just proclaim the gospel. And just go, man, Jesus did this with me so you would know that you can have a new life too. And I started to tell people, and let me back up really quick, because this is what happened before that. So, and this is important. So, man, I had this new life, I had this sales job, and I was making good money, and I didn't know I was making good money, because I was spending it all on drugs, and all of a sudden I had this huge pay raise, and so I was like, oh my gosh, I make a lot of money. And I was driving around a couple weeks after I met Jesus, and I was so excited, because I was like, oh my gosh, I've never been on a vacation before, and I've never done this, and I've never done this, I'm gonna do all this stuff, and I'll never forget the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart in that moment as I was driving to a sales appointment. He goes, you think I saved you for you? And I pulled over on the side of the road and cried. <laughs> and then I went home and I was like, I seriously, man, my flesh died. I, I probably seven days. I just like laid in bed. <laughs> and my wife would come in and she'd go, What's wrong? Let's watch a show. And I'm like, nothing matters. <laughs> None of it matters. It's not about me. It's not what I want. You know, it's like I had this realization right away that Jesus was like, hey, listen, it, this is for you, but this is not about you. Right? And those two things are so close, we get those mixed up a lot. 
And it's like, no, 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 no. this is for you, but this is not about you. And I just had that realization that, like, okay, I'm called to something bigger um, than I can even know. And so, anyways, I started making these videos. People started giving their life to Jesus. It was this crazy move of people just contacting me and coming and talking and giving their life to Jesus. And some people in the videos going, I gave my life to Jesus after I watched this video today. And then they would show up, and then we had a men's meeting, and uh, it turned into something awesome, you know, that was a really recovered start. And we started going to this one church, and you know they had some conflict with us uh, because of we were baptizing people, but it wasn't people in their church. It was people who really recovered, people that never went to a church or were scared to go in a building. I remember the first time we walked in a church building, um, we gave our testimony to my wife on the testimony. Megan goes, um, we walked in, and I thought we were going to catch on fire, <laughs> but I looked at Ken, and he didn't catch on fire, so I knew I was good. That's what she said. And so, <laughs> so that, that's the, that's, I think, and I think people don't understand, like, that's a lot of times, you know, these people from the streets and stuff, like I was, because I knew what it was like to have a lot, and I knew what it was like to sleep behind a dumpster on Howard Street, and uh, I, I think a lot of times that's the, that's kind of the view that they have, they're like scared to enter a church building or something, because they don't know who Jesus is. Right? They don't know. They think he's just wanting to crush them up there because of what they've done and not recognizing like it's the love of Jesus that, cha that changes us, right? In that living room that night, I encountered the love of Jesus. I never left you. Like, how is that even possible? Like, I want to leave, right? Like, it's just like, how could you still love me? And it's in that moment that I experienced the love of Jesus that I'm like, I'm going to leave you, you know? Like, and so it's the love of Jesus that changes us. And so, anyways, people started giving their life to Jesus. Um, you know, we had this thing really recovered, didn't even know what it was happening. Um, all these addicts being healed um, from drug addiction, people handing over their pipes and their drugs. And at the end of messages, when we finally got our own place, and what, what really happened though was like I hit the book of Acts and I got to Acts chapter two. And I went in and told my wife, I said, this is what it's supposed to look like. See, I was, I loved, this might sound bad, but I was too stupid to get in the way. I just was too stupid. I just didn't know. I didn't have people that have, you know, since then I've had people say ridiculous things and tell me, you can't expect a miracle all the time, can you? It's like, have you read this? Because, like, that's what happens time after time, and we were witnessing it. And so, when I got to Acts chapter 2, and I was just undone, and I just... Went and told my wife, like, hey, this is what it looks like. I didn't even really know what church looked like. I only knew what I had seen here and there. But I was like, this is what it looks like. We need to open our home. And we need to just, less for us means more for others. And we were just like, it, you know, everybody had everything they needed. And they were just all together. And they were just addicted to Jesus, right? That's what, it, that's what was happening here. I was just going... They were just addicted to Jesus. They were now Jesus-dependent instead of chemically dependent. That's how I looked at it. So we started to open our home to people and take people in. And uh, it started real real small. Like, I mean, there was like six people on a Sunday. And I was like, I'll cook some pancakes and we'll read the Word of God and we'll pray. And then six turned into 12, turned into 60. And there was a standing room only. And we didn't have a band. We didn't have anything, right? We just... We just were like, hey, we're going to pray and open this book, and his words are alive and powerful, and we just, people started handing over drugs and being healed of psych meds. There were people on 13 psych meds when I met them in psych wards, some of them sitting here right now, clothed and perfectly sane, um, and just like, we just saw the power of Jesus, and we just continued to witness that. So... Anyways, like, you know, we, we said, uh, we said, I, well, I, I told Jesus, I said, what do I need to be held accountable? Because everybody was starting to come to me, and a lot of people that I knew in other churches, we, were, we weren't part of any denomination. I, like, we were just in my living room and just reading the word, and people were being saved and healed and all kinds of stuff. And so I knew people in other churches, and they started to come to me and go, hey, you need accountability in your life accountability. I don't think that's a bad thing, 
But listen, if I would have let some of those people be the accountability of my life right now, the spirit would be completely stifled. <laughs> and so, like, I agreed with them. And so I said, well, I'm not against accountability, but I want Jesus to pick it. So that's what brought me to a prayer time of, hey, Jesus, where do I need to be held accountable? And the answer is not what I expected, because he said that you go to act on <laughs> And so, like, he wasn't like, you need to pick this person or this person needs to mentor you. He was like, that you go to Akron. I could clearly hear him speaking to me. And so I was like, okay, Jesus, you open the door and we'll go. And two days later, somebody called me from, uh, they had a sober house in Akron that had failed three times. And they called me and they just said, hey, do you think really recovery could use this house? All you have to do is pay utilities. And it's in Akron. And I'm like, okay. So we went there, we cleaned it up. We prayed in the driveway and we just said, okay, we're just going to take broken people and put them in Jesus' feet and he's going to raise the dead. And people thought that was crazy. They're like, you can't do that. You need uh, counselors and you need this. And I'm like, Jesus is the wonderful counselor, right? Like, he, he, look at what he did with me. Um, I was never diagnosed with anything. If somebody would have got their hands on me in that closet, I can only imagine the pills that I would be on, right? Um, and so... That's what happened. We just started taking people and put them at Jesus' feet in that house, and Jesus just did what Jesus does. And people just started to know him and have new life and be healed from addiction. And so there we were. We had a house in Akron. We were in Wadsworth, and um, we needed to be incarnational. Jesus told me, hey, you need to be incarnational, live among your people. So me and my wife were picked up. We moved to Akron on um, one of the same streets that I used to buy dope and sell dope. And, down the street from all the dope houses where I lived, and we went there and rented a house, and um, and Jesus was just doing amazing things, and um, we were turning down women, and we started praying for a women's house, and it just didn't seem like it was going to happen, and one day we get a call from a woman, and Megan's about to turn her down, and we're sitting at dinner, and I just said, let's just take them in our house. And so we cleaned up the basement, painted it up, made it nice, put beds down there, dressers and stuff like that, and started taking women in. And next thing you know, we had five women in the house, and all of them encountering Jesus and having new life. And um, I had picked one up in the middle of the night uh, that, that called and said that she needed help, and she was beaten pretty bad and had been shooting up fentanyl in her jugular vein. And, uh, picked her up, brought her back to the house, and I, I didn't get any sleep that night. And I was preaching at a men's breakfast the next morning um, in Stowe, and I remember crying in the parking lot because I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't have time to do my sermon prep, right? And so I went in very weak, and Jesus' power was made perfect because I went in there weak, and all I did was just tell them what Jesus has been doing. Don't remember exactly what I said. I came out of Isaiah somewhere, and I, I still to this day can't tell you what I said because it doesn't matter what I said. Um, but that whole room was just moved, and this guy was just bawling. And afterwards, he calls me over. He's just crying and sobbing, and he goes, "Hey, he goes, look, I gotta, I gotta buy a women's house for you." And I'm going, "Okay." And uh, and this is how you know, guys. This is how you know it's the Holy Spirit. He's crying, and he goes, how much is it going to cost? And I'm like, I don't know, like Akron, 25, 30 grand? And he goes, man, I really hope it's 25 and not 30. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he was like compelled to just, it didn't matter. He goes, but it's not my money, I have to do it no matter what. And he was just like, I got to do it. And he was a volunteer at the Akron Pregnancy Services, you know, for the women and stuff. And so it was it was close to his heart. And so Jesus just spoke to him, and, and sure enough, we got a house for 25 grand, and he wrote a check for it, and we moved the women in there. And so Akron was happening. I came out to Worcester, and I'm, I'm skipping a lot of stuff. I came out to Worcester and started praying with uh, Lucas and Amanda over there. They're, we met them from, um, they were in Alliance Church, and they came uh, in Worcester, and they came to, at North Blue Alliance, they came to one of our meetings, uh, we had a men, uh, co-ed meeting in Creston at a church of God over here, Creston Community Church. We got a partnership with them um, where they kind of just threw us the keys and they were like, hey, we've been sitting around going, what can we do for addiction in our city? And somebody made the mistake uh, at a recovery meeting they had there of inviting me to come speak. And so I came out there and dropped the gospel and, and it was just this amazing move of the spirit even there. And uh, the pastor there was just like, hey, Here's the keys to the building. We'll give you one, 2% of our tithes. 
and you guys just be the addiction ministry here. And so we've had that partnership since the beginning. It's been awesome to have that partnership with them. And so Lucas and Amanda came to that meeting to see what's going on. They have, uh, I just found out not too long ago, they never really had a drink. Um, and so that's awesome because it just shows you what we're talking about today with Peter and those guys. And so they just have a heart for broken people and lost people. And they just like, want to be a part of this. They had moved to Worcester a long time ago before I even knew Jesus and were praying to reach the addicts and the homeless people there and asking God to send somebody. And um, we met them, did our initial discipleship with them and stuff. And a couple of years, I think, went by and nothing was happening at all. And I always had my, my sights set on Cleveland because I'm from the streets and I'm going, I got to get to the streets. And Jesus turned me around and faced me towards Worcester. And I was like, okay. <laughs> All right, so so he knows what he's doing, and um, and so I came came out to Worcester. And all I could do was like every other Tuesday night, I was like I could pray. That's where that's where, that's where, that's how much time. Every other Tuesday night, I come out for an hour or so, and we can pray, and that's where it started. And uh, one of our guys, Seth, joined in that prayer meeting. He was lived in Burbank, and we would just walk the streets and pray, and sit in the living room and pray, and go, man, we need to reach lost people, and there's a jail here, and so. We started to pray for Jesus to open up doors for us to have a men's meeting at the jail and uh, started to call and try and see if we could get in there and have a meeting um, with the people in charge, like the, the chaplain. And the chaplain was dying of stage four cancer and uh, did not know that. Um, and so I was leaving messages. He wasn't getting them. He ends up passing away. And two of the guys in our Akron house uh, were like, the worst of the worst in Worcester, in that county jail, and they had been given new life and transformed. And so they knew the chapter in the past. And so they said, hey, we want to go to his funeral. I said, yeah, go ahead. Um, so they left the men's act in the house, they went to the funeral, and while they were there, the captain and the lieutenant saw them across the room and went, those aren't the same guys. And so the captain and the lieutenant went over to them and started to talk to them and said, how is this possible? And they were like, Jesus, and they were like, we're really recovered, you should talk to our pastor. They gave him a card, and I left him a message. They called me, I came out, I told him the whole story that I've told you right now, and asked him if I could have a men's meeting, and they went, hey, you can have a room here to do a men's meeting, do whatever you want, and they slid me an application. <laughs> and, and I slid it back. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't think, you, did you guys hear everything I just told you? You know, like there's background checks and lie detectors and stuff. We can go in here. Um, and they just were like, no, we've interviewed a ton of people and you're our guy. And I was just like, and here it is, right? I go, they go, just take the app. And so I go, okay. And so I'm driving back home to Akron. And as I'm driving, I'm just going, and it's like one of those stupid conversations you have with Jesus where you've been praying for open doors for like months. And then you're like, Jesus, should I do this? You know, and it's just like, <laughs> I just see him like up there like, <laughs> can I open a door even wider than that? And so I filled it out, man. I filled out everything. He was like, have you ever been convicted of a crime you didn't get caught for? I was like, oh. I'm putting it, I'm putting, I'm flipping it over, I'm filling it in the back. I'm going, look, if, if they do this, everybody's going to know Jesus did something. And so I turned it all in, and they called me in for the lie detector test. And the detective said they had to give me a reverse lie detector test because I've told them everything and usually they're trying to catch you from not telling them something. And I told them so much, they had to ask me in reverse to make sure I wasn't lying, you know? And, and like, yeah. And so they, they were like, you're, you're hired. And so we, we had to move to Worcester. So we picked up our family and moved to Worcester uh, the first day of quarantine, which was fun. Um, and here we went from living with 16 people that's how we live. We just live like the book of Acts. So we live with 16 people, and that was just me and my wife and our kids, our four kids, and everybody had their own room, and it was weird. And um, it was about a week went by like that, and Jesus is like, we're renting this house outside of town. It's the only place we can find. It's more expensive than I can really afford, but it's the only place we can find. And so we're renting this house outside of town. It's on a property that's two and a half acres, and it's got two fully remodeled houses, and a uh, and a motel in the back that's been abandoned forever. And so here we are renting this, this house up front, and um, the men's house in Akron starts to overflow. And they're like, where are we gonna put these people? And they're trying to put them in their own houses and stuff, but there's not enough room. And so uh, me and Megan were like, hey, we'll take some. And they're thinking like, hey, we'll take two or something. I think we took four or six. And I'm like, 
send them over, you know? So next thing you know, we got nine guys living in our house with us, and me and Megan give up our kids' rooms, move them in with us, and then we moved to the attic, and that just became the men's house. And the guy who owned the property saw what was happening, apostolic guy loves Jesus, and he, um, one day we're sitting at the a meeting at the Salvation Army, and we're praying, Jesus, we need a house for these men, we need sober-minded houses. And the next day, and the landlord was not there. The owner of the property was not at that prayer meeting. Next morning, 10.30 in the morning, he texts me and he goes, I gotta to come talk to you. And he comes and he goes, you gotta have this, this property. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he's like, you gotta have this whole property. He goes, I bought this property so I can help people. And he goes, and you're doing it. And I'm seeing what's happening here. And Jesus wants you to have this whole property. And I'm just like, whoa. And so, like, here we are renting the house that Jesus would eventually give us. And met Steve Steiner and Leanna in the meantime while we were praying in Worcester. And they were, you know, part of J.C. Jules. Amanda was part of J.C. Jules. My wife, had got, she got to go one time before the quarantine happened at the jail. But they had been working on a, a women's house committee trying to find a, a women's house. Sat down with Steve Steiner and told him the story, uh, what Jesus was going to really recover. And I love I love Steve. We had him on stage at District Conference. It was the first time the CMA ever had a Mennonite on stage at District Conference. It was awesome. And, uh, and, and I just, I, I love him and his heart, and, um, and I love his honesty, too, because he was like, we want to do this, this house thing, and I sat down and told him the ins and outs of what it looked like, and at the end of it, he goes, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and he goes, but I want to be a part of that being done. So he was like, we just want to partner with you, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And, uh, and that's how that partnership came about. So, you know, he had tried to find some houses, they could have fallen through, and then he came over to my house for a meeting, and while he's sitting there in the side yard, I go, the property we're sitting on right now, it, the guy wants to give it to us and, and sell it to us, you know. And that started where everybody started coming together, your guys' denomination, and the, the brethren, I didn't even know what a brethren was, and I got to go there with them and spend time with them. It was awesome to meet them, and I love our car out there, and uh, Smithville Brethren. And, and so then the apostolics and the Amish are coming out, thrown on roofs, and I'm getting to tell them what Jesus is doing, and like, hey, this just isn't another roof that you're doing on this motel. And, and so that's been the wild ride to get us to where we're at. I know I took all the time, but I, I just, that's the shortest I can tell it, and leaving out people being, you know, physically healed from heart and surgeries before they even go and different things. So, I mean, we've just, I've, I've been spoiled, like really, to just have a front row seat, to just see Jesus in a powerful way, um, work miracle after miracle after miracle. And, and, and that's why I say things like, hey, you gotta push against you got to push against uh, seeing things from a human point of view. You just have to. I've ran into so many people that are just like, you know, Ken, you just can't expect a miracle around. And that stuff starts to weigh on you, you know, over time if you let it. And and I just always have to push against it. it you know, be, it, it's like it says in 2 Corinthians 5 that I was talking about today. It goes, hey, if we seem crazy, it's for your benefit, right? If we seem crazy, it's because we actually believe this. You know, and and I want to live by the power of God. Um, to be a lot of talk, um, but we all have the opportunity to see Jesus move in a powerful way like that. You know, um, so that that's how we got here. And so now we have these. You know, me and my family moved from the attic in the men's house to the sun porch on the women's house, and we got we got like. I just had a meeting with the district the other day. We got a potential of five other churches and other locations that want to partner with Really Recovered and do what we're doing here and what we're doing in Akron, what Jesus is doing. We're really not doing anything. We're holding on for dear life. Yeah. Um, that's what I've been doing. I'm like, like dude, uh, it's kind of like when you, you know, when my kids would sit on my foot and I'd walk around the house and they'd come along for the ride, that's me. I'm just sitting on Jesus' is, you know, just sitting on Daddy's lap and, and enjoying the ride and, and going where Jesus wants to go and doing what he wants to do. And so, um, yeah, that's that's how we got here. I, I, I know I didn't leave much room for questions. I'm sorry about that. Um, but we're all gonna have lunch, right? And so, if we can grab some of the people that you see here. They all, 
you know, some of the really recovered people, if you have questions, or myself, and ask them some questions about what Jesus is doing, they'll tell you. But we got like these five partnerships, possibly in like Geneva and Cleveland and West Virginia and uh, Brooklyn and uh, Mansfield. Yes, Mansfield. That's our our closest one. And so, you know, got our eyes on a couple houses out in Mansfield. And right now, just praying for, for those houses, you know. Uh, it's, like a, it's like 90, 100 grand to get both those houses. And we're just, we know Jesus will make a way. He always does. And he always does things in a way where we can't take any credit for it, right? Where it's just like to move his spirit. He prompts us to step out in faith. And um, we just get to be a part of his thing. So, that's it.